Hello there. My name's Francis Gerard. I've led a fairly active life producing and directing documentaries worldwide. I'm now in my 70s, getting on. But I find I'm working much harder than before. Every day I'm discovering new things about myself, my experiences, a meaning to the complicated journey I've taken to get to where I am. And if there's a word to describe this, it's origins. You may laugh when you look at me and hear me telling you that to my boots, I'm an African. It's a fact that all of us originated in Africa. My conversation with you today is how I discovered that being an African is at the heart of who I am. My journey wasn't planned, it was entirely accidental. So in 2006, after five years of intense work, the Origin Centre opened its doors in Johannesburg. It's a museum and a centre of study, tracing the extraordinary history of early hominid settlement in Africa, dating back millions of years before our arrival as Homo sapiens. The team I'd been leading consisted of architects, historians, archaeologists, designers, educators, and many more. President Tabu and Becky, whose idea it had been, kindly opened the centre. For me, it had been a labour of love, an exploration of my own past, one all we humans share. So here goes in explaining who, why and what led me to realise and understanding my roots. Well, first of all, despite my claim, I know I don't look much like someone who comes from Africa. I'm not. In fact, I was born here in London almost 75 years ago. And like many people, I know the exact date I was conceived on. It was Tuesday the 8th of May, 1945. Victory in Europe Day. My parents, both in the Secret Service, had met, celebrated, and I was the result. Then in December 1946, as a ten-month-old, we travelled by flying boat down to Durban in South Africa. My parents had decided life in a warm country might suit us all. And it did. I loved where we lived. Our home was the only house for miles around, built on a hilltop in the valley of a thousand hills in Natal. My life was as idyllic as it could be for a small boy. Wild African bush with a Zulu kraal far below our house that became my second home. For me, it was a life of wildness and freedom, but even then, the politics and racial troubles that figure so much in my later career were already around me. Unknown to me, my novelist father had become friendly with a fellow writer, Alan Payton, he of the great book, Cry the Beloved Country. The two instantly became firm friends and involved in opposition politics as a new white Africana government arrived with their policy of apartheid. Shoes and proper school followed at six. Apart from history and poetry, schooling wasn't my cup of tea, much to my parents' disappointment. They were resigned to having an idiot son. Then everything changed at 16, when a friend gave me his old camera. Suddenly my entire life came into focus. I found I had an eye, and that combined with my interest in anti-apartheid politics, which I had by now absorbed, quickly led to news and then documentary filming. I moved to Swaziland before, in 1967, deciding to travel north across the continent. A pal and I hitched, caught buses, and had a fascinating four months on the road, before reaching Juba in southern Sudan. At that point, the Arab-Israeli war broke out and it became immediately clear that travelling further north was out of the question. So we travelled back to Mombasa in Kenya and took a tramp steamer to Karachi via the Seychelles. My onward route to London took me through Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Iran and Turkey. 
and opened my eyes to life on the margins where poverty was widespread. Arrival into a cold Britain in November that year was a shock to the system. My uncle kindly housed me and told me that a Christmas job was in order. Go and try the larger department stores, he advised. And so the job I landed for six weeks over that year in was as a shop assistant on the ground floor of Fortnum and Mason in Piccadilly. I was fitted out in a tailcoat and helped wealthy individuals shop. <laughs> it was a hoot, especially as at first I had to deal with a senior floor staff who had decided that this boy from the colonies was fair game. My bottom was pinched black and blue that first week as I discovered that I was the only straight on the floor. Of course, this endeared me to the girls two floors up. Thereafter, life in the late 60s in London was a blur of fashion photographer's assistant, photographing for the International Times, accompanying Tarek Ali on anti-war marches. Then finally I got a break, helping film a biography of Lini Riefenstahl, the pro-Nazi film director. Fast forward to the late 1970s, where BBC Current Affairs realised they needed to explain to the British public what had happened in the so-called Soweto Uprising in 1976. My face fitted, and the boy from the colonies returned to research and co-direct a major series on Afrikanerdom, entitled The White Tribe of Africa. It was presented by the delightful David Dibbleby. Fortunately, it won prizes, and I was snapped up to join David's brother, Jonathan, to produce anything we fancied. The first five years of the 1980s rushed by filming across the globe. The film of which I'm most proud, though, is called The Bomb, and in part, it told the story of Hiroshima. Here is a very small part describing the first few days after the bomb dropped. I must warn you, it's deeply distressing. On the morning of August the 6th, 1980, Mrs. Tomoyasu prepared for the day as usual. As usual, the city stirred at dawn and hustled early into work. As usual, the streets were clogged by 8.15. But this was no usual hour, no ordinary day. This is Hiroshima. moment of heat and blast, Hiroshima had ceased to be. 70,000 people died instantly. Another 70,000 lingered for days and weeks in agony, mortally wounded, or poisoned by lethal doses of nuclear radiation. There had been no warning, no hope of escape. Within a fortnight, Japan had surrendered. Nuclear terror had come of age. I saw a sharp white flash and then another more powerful. That for a moment blinded me. My first thought was for my daughter. I had to go out and find her. The horror has since been recorded in the paintings of some of those who survived.
Mrs. Tomoyasu picked her way through the wasteland towards the station in search of her daughter. On the way, I saw a girl coming towards me who was completely burned and naked. Her skin had peeled off from head to toe. It is impossible to describe. It was too dreadful. There was something dragging behind her like a cloth. I wondered what it was. Then I realized it was her skin which had peeled off, dried and remained stuck to her heels. I saw many people like her coming towards me. Late 1980s saw me making my first feature film, A Private Life, based on a true story of a love affair between a white policeman and a woman who's classified non-white. I'd filmed the couple and their children for the White Tribe series. Produced at the BBC by the brilliant Innes Lloyd, with a script by witty Andrew Davis. The subject of the film was very personal. My world had become European and cosmopolitan, but the passion that motivated me still went back to the Zululand of my boyhood and the injustices I saw there on a daily basis. Then, in the early 90s, a senior British politician lost his parliamentary seat, and this took me out to Hong Kong in 1992. The politician was Chris Patton, and Jonathan Dibbleby reported the five-hour series, one for each year of his tenure as the last governor. Here's a promo taster. The central aspect of the governor's policy is entirely self-destructive. I think there is a very good chance of the electoral arrangements we put in place this year surviving through 97. No, no way. That's a myth. Why have we got the business community thinking the pattern's got it wrong? Quite simply, uh, businessmen are interested in their money. The result is 28 for the eyes, 29 for the nose. Yes! He handles the Chinese like the opposition party. He handles us as the opposition party. And I think whatever opposing to him, he will handle it that way. Mr. Hong Kong, yes. well done, everybody. No. Ah. Chris Patton made up to Beijing three months into his tenure as governor turned out to be his one and only trip to China. A free morning allowed me to walk the length of that extraordinary forbidden city. It was very cold and somehow the majesty of the buildings and the ghosts that were still present invited me to return. I did, two years later, when I spent six months making a portrait of the fabulous palace and my favourite emperor, Kangxi. It was pure magic, and I fell head over heels in love with China. Giving life to people and killing people. These are the powers that I have as emperor. Nevertheless, as emperor and ruler, one is subject to the mandate of heaven. Every winter at the Temple of Heaven, the rulers of the great empire of China repeated the sacred vows which gave them the power of life and death over the most populous nation on earth. Bearing the title Sons of Heaven, the emperors received their power from the gods on high.
served by an army of tens of thousands of eunuchs, surrounded by courtiers and concubines to service their every need. For 500 years, the emperors lived as earthly gods in a world of myth and legend. As I was completing the last Governor series, I took up an offer several senior Chinese individuals had asked of me to make a series of documentary films based, in part, on the great sinologist Joseph Needham's work on China. The result, entitled China the Dragon's Ascent, was an eight-hour television series and a book. A different company, a different continent, a different culture, but for the first time I began to explore man's earliest history, his origins and creativity. I'm the eldest, so I should be their model and look after them. We should be close. We too should listen to our eldest brother. We should respect him and do what he says. I listen to and obey both of them. If I do anything wrong, they can slap me and I don't dare react. First, we have to obey our parents. If they're not at home, we obey our eldest brother. <laughs> Men are always in charge of things outside the home. Women stay at home doing the cleaning, washing, cooking and other housework, as well as feeding chickens and bringing up children. <laughs> Women have to obey men. Because they have long hair, they have very short vision. A husband is master of his wife, a father is master of his sons, and an emperor is master of all his subjects. It means that a wife has to obey her husband. In the village, men are superior to women. It's as simple as that. And so we come full circle back to 2006, and Tabo and Becky opening the Origin Centre. My wife and child had made a home in South Africa for the first five years it took to deliver. As I said, it explains how humanity has its roots in Africa and answers many of the questions of how we humans developed and spread across the globe. In developing the Origin Centre, modern science allowed us to offer DNA tests to interested people. In promoting the centre, I had mine done. Luckily, I have a really interesting DNA history. My male line could be tra traced back to the 13th century around the fertile lands between the Tigris and the Euphrates River that defined Mesopotamia. My male ancestors then moved on to northern Europe, Norway and Sweden. And then, around 1500 years ago, my male and female links cemented somewhere on the coast of France. Could I have been the issue of a Viking raid? It's funny how life takes one full circle. Successful filmmaking involves building a team around the work. With the Origin Centre, the team we built 18 years ago continues through to today. The seven key individuals are still partners and designing educational centres and projects to this day. Although now living back in London, my family and I are still in and out of Africa regularly. Each time I arrive there, it's a homecoming. It energises me to think it was my original home many thousands of years before my white parents arrived on its shores. That was what the original home of every person on the planet. Now that you know we're all Africans under the skin, 
I wish you well. Travel well, fellow Africans, and thank you for watching.